let me ambassador Dred Guptaji, president of ARSP, ambassador Bina Sikri ji, Dr. C. Radha Dutta ji, Professor Smriti Patnayak ji, distinguished participants in the audience, all protocol object. It is my privilege and honor to welcome you all to this roundtable workshop on India-Bangladesh bilateral relations today in ARSP house, Rika Pravas. Bangladesh is a very important neighbor of India. ARSP, especially Ambassador Bred Gupta, has always emphasized to strengthen the relationship with the neighboring countries. And that is the, the, the principle and philosophy of today's government also, neighborhood first. Bangladesh and India share the longest land boundary than any other neighboring countries. And we had a conference in Calcutta and there a great person from Bangladesh, Iftikhar Ahmad, said that our relation is relation of blood. And India and Bangladesh share a unique relationship, not only of blood, but the cultural, linguistic, and historical also. Everybody remembers India relationship with Bangladesh was laid in 1971. Bangladesh Liberation War, India provided critical military and material support to assist Bangladesh in its fight for independence from Pakistan. There were little bit ups and downs for a couple of decades, but I can see that when Sheikh Hashina came in power in 1996, the script of new chapter was written. And bilateral ties with treaty on sharing the Ganga water was the breakthrough. Since then, India and Bangladesh have built cooperation in trade, energy, infrastructure, connectivity, and defense, and many other areas. In Bangladesh has emerged the largest trade partners in South Asia. Trading risk US dollar 18 billion in 2021-22 from 10.8 billion in 2021. India has a line of credit also worth US dollar 7 billion. These are just some examples how India Bangladesh nation has been strengthened in recent times. India Bangladesh has resolved many of the issues, including the land boundary agreement and maritime dispute over territorial water. You don't have be mistake, master plan for transport connectivity is another great breakthrough where we are thinking to connect with road to Bangladesh, to Myanmar, Thailand and establishing a shipping network. Bangladesh is important to India for several reasons, and most important is geopolitical. The location and the situation of Bangladesh with India is very, very important to seeing how the influence of China and other, other countries can, 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 be, can, can be mentioned. Another region is the economic region, that we can have the opportunity, a more poss possibility of having more economic activities. Cultural is most important that we can have a lot of strengthening relation through culture because we come from the same culture. We are we, we are same people. And strategy wise also Bangladesh is very important for us for the whole Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean to see that we can have a good 
relationship with all this. Environmental concern is definitely many. It was mentioned just now that Bangladesh is most populous country, and and as we talk about New Delhi, and we we have to see that how we can see that Delta and Sundarban all these things can be preserved, and can see that that can become the thing. The main point of tension also between India and Bangladesh. I will not mention all, but few of them, so that the speakers. We don't want to take much time, and speakers are great people uh, who have the experience at the ground, and we are here to listen to them. But I will mention a few points which are the great concern at moment, and that is a mention how to address those issues, like sharing the transboundary river waters is still. We have talked about the water, but there are still many rivers. Illegal immigrations is another issue which is concerned between relation between uh, Bangladesh and India. Drug smuggling and trafficking is another concern, great concern. And growing China influence in Bangladesh is also one of the major concerns of India, how to, how to balance that one. And I'm sure speakers know all these things and they will they will definitely address in their issues how to see that what can be done to talk about transboundary uh, river waters sharing, drug trafficking, growing Chinese influence, and illegal immigration, including Rohingya problems. We India has very successfully acknowledged G20, and we are talking about global south, and India has become the the voice of Global South, including Bangladesh. And we can see that how we can promote the Basudhava Kutumkam. And in that vein, ARSP is organizing a series of discussion and debates with neighboring countries, starting with Bangladesh. I think many there are many areas of potential where India can, can address and have the way Ambassador Dhyan Gupta mentioned always, that we should have not only the economic, rather rather people to people contact. There, when we have we were talking before COVID, there a meeting in Calcutta. That was also concern of some Bangladeshi people who are participating. That many people come from Bangladesh, but same is not in the term of Indians going to Bangladesh. They come for treatment, they come for education, they come for tourism. But how to, to reciprocate that one was a great concern and how we can liberate, liberalize some of the, 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 the rules about the visa and other things. And that was the great concern which education is the great area where India and Bangladesh can see the possibility of greater cooperation. Health, definitely India has better, better facilities than they want. Food and business can also be enhanced. Cultural exchange and civilizational dimension is one thing which India has a soft power, and we, we can see that we can we can increase these things where we can we can see that how we can have more cultural cultural exchange with Bangladesh. To reach comes in the cultural so defense also we can see that how we can support defense, and no moreover last but not least seminar and conferences of this nature, where we can talk with intellectuals and those who have lived there and roughs up there in various capacity on behalf of government of India, at least they can share their views, what need to be done, what is the expressions of the people of Bangladesh and what need to be done. And that is that is the purpose that this, this seminar and workshop has been organized to brainstorming what are that, that the way Brindh Gupta was just mentioning just now, that the way government thinks that everything is okay, it's not true. There are a lot of things can be done. And in India, when we are growing and from fifth largest economy to third, as we are, we are growing, we are the largest democracy, naturally our responsibility is bigger to see that how we can, we can, we can promote those things that wherever there is not true, which is not correct, we should correct it also. We should improve our relation with neighboring countries. That is in our interest also. It is in our interest and interest of the region also that we should, we should promote. So with these few words, I welcome all of you. 
again and in spite of taking much time perhaps we should listen to the to the experts who, are, who have come and really appreciate for for their their their, their, their <clears throat> well thank you very much um, mark henry ji uh, before i uh, start inviting our very distinguished uh, analysts uh, i just like to uh, our discussions today in the perspective of um, our decision to um, uh, more intensify uh, our engagement with the neighboring countries, particularly at people to people and civil society level. Um, we do believe that um, neighboring region is extremely important for us as is for any other country. And um, one of the biggest um, areas where a lot of work needs to be done is to build a requisite trust. And understanding. You know, we are geographically connected. Um, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, there are a lot of projects which can be undertaken, uh, economic cooperation projects, both at government levels and business levels. Many of these things not proceeding uh, as uh, well as one would have imagined them to be. And I think the main reason which brings back our relation uh, is the, is the uh, mistrust. Uh, not not just the lack of trust, but actual, in a more negative connotation, uh, mistrust. And uh, I think uh, governments are doing their work, but uh, at the level of people also, uh, the physical trust needs to be developed. Uh, we, what do we, what, what is it that we require to do in India? Uh, you know, the a popular um, a narrative in new neighboring countries is that India is very large and India is trying to dominate. Uh, the um, discourse is trying to suggest to these countries as to what they should do. Uh, India is trying to restrict their options. In plain and simple terms, that India is trying to restrict their problem options. And, and I think it doesn't go down well with anybody. Um, we uh, find ourselves asking this question many times. In fact, um, uh, for instance, Nepal, uh, we attended a seminar there, and uh, now any little thing that China does, and it becomes like a red light for us. Uh, so we seem to labor under this negative perception, and this is not just neighbor. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, I was at the university, we were invited to South African ambassador. Uh, now our relationship with South Africa is seen through the same prism of. We, we tend to worry far more about what South, South Africa is doing with China and not about what South Africa can do with India, what India can do with South Africa. Now, simply put, the needs of Nepal, I'm just giving an example, are enormous. There's so much that India just cannot so meet all the requirements, but they need 50,000 crores. We can't provide 50,000 crores. We can provide just a fraction of that amount of money. But the rest will have to come from elsewhere. And and we understand this, then you know, we, we will not be constraining their sovereign space. Uh, that That is extremely important, that we are there, but how will the others be? We uh, tend to ask a Nepalese to choose between India and China. If I were a Nepalese, I would like to choose both India and China. As we, we forget that uh, in the 60s and the 70s, we chose both Soviet Union and America. We had close relationship with Soviet Union. Uh, so I think this uh, is zero sum game. This is some game in, in diplomacy. In international relations, we can optimize our relationship, optimizing our relationship with the first group of countries. And I think we should have a large enough heart to allow the same space to others. That's we, we seek to promote these dialogues in that understanding, in that perspective, that we need to create better trust. And first, we need to introspect that. There is, there is a lot that needs to be done, and we have a greater responsibility being larger neighbors. Uh, of course, those countries will also have to show greater sensitivity to our security needs. So with these few words, 
I'd like to invite first, um, we changing the order a little bit at the request of the presenters themselves. Um, I will start uh, right from the uh, farthest corner, uh, Dr. Shilara Datta. She's um, a very well-known expert on Bangladesh. Uh, she worked for many years at the IDSA. She's written several books. Um, after that, uh, she moved to Nikais um, in Calcutta and um, at the uh, Vivekanan uh, Foundation. And now she's um, at the Delhi University. Uh, so over to you, uh, Shirada. Thank you, Viru, for the invitation. Always happy to see you and be here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Day. Happy to have Ambassador Sikri and Smriti on the panel. Mm -hmm. um, so I think background has already been made by the chair, and I'm not going to get into details, except for starting by saying that what India and Bangladesh share today at this point of time is unprecedentedly the best bilateral ties that we've ever seen. Um, the kind of engagement that we are able to do with Bangladesh, it spans across every sector, which was never the case earlier. Uh, this breakthrough, uh, we are all aware of it, that we, it started with the joint communique that India and Bangladesh has signed in 2010, uh, which was the beginning of the cross-border transport facilities, economic corridors, uh, and most importantly, the transit that Bangladesh gave to India. All of that that we've done since 2010, and I think it's every year we've been able to um, add to that in terms of the kind of project partnership that we're doing, the development partnership, um, economic engagement, a um, whole lot of government, as I said. And again, of course, defense is one of the very new items included in the list and has certainly been substantial in the last couple of years. Uh, but all of this, and in, we just heard Viru sir talk about the line of credit that Bangladesh, in fact, was offered one billion to begin with. It's about seven point eight just now, uh, which is the largest that India has given to any of its neighbor. So clearly, uh, there is a whole lot of robust engagement there. But all of this has been premised on one criteria: that is, Bangladesh addressed India's security concerns. Uh, when Sheikh Hasina took over in 2000, she was ushered in. She was voted with a huge majority in the December 2008 election and actually took office in January. Uh, even before she had anything to do with India in terms of a bilateral, formal bilateral tie, she had uh, cleaned out all the anti India camps that used to reside on the Bangladesh borders. Uh, she actually handled many of those individuals who were responsible for leading those anti India activities. Mm -hmm. uh, she also opened up a particular old case, which is known as the Chittagong Arms Hall case, which was responsible for wanting to. Uh, was transporting a huge arms cache to the Northeast. So that was the beginning and clearly uh, beginning of the trust factor also, because we realized this was a completely new era. Uh, the chairman also mentioned the water treaty that was signed, Ganges water treaty, when Sheikh Hasina had become the prime minister for the first time, which was in 2000, uh, 1996. Two landmark treaties took place. One is the Ganges water treaty and the Chittagong Accord. Uh, which, as you know, where we had issues there and that was able to address. So the Ganges water treaty is now coming up for a renewal. How do I see the relation just now? I think it's a fact that, uh, and we've always argued this, that irrespective of who's in Delhi, they work with the Bangladesh government. But unfortunately, as the case may be, and I'm sure Ambassador Sikri is here, She'll talk about that from her personal experience that, unfortunately, we've seen that it's never been possible for India to work with all the colors of Bangladesh. And we, for historical reason, have been very comfortable with our meal. It was, of course, Mujibur Rahman and the liberation war that we're all aware of. And then, of course, her his daughter, with the Sheikh Hasina. Uh, so, in the first phase, when she was the first time Prime Minister, we had an extremely good engagement with her. But of course, she didn't have the strength to do many of the things. When she came back with the largest 
percentage of voters and the, in the parliament, she was able to do a lot more things that India had hoped for. And thus began the bilateral engagement. Over the years, as I said, uh, the respect of who was in Delhi, uh, Delhi and Dhaka has worked together. Fake her scene. In fact, I remember when 2014, when elections results were being announced in uh, Delhi, I was sitting in Dhaka. Uh, the kind of uh, apprehension I would say Dhaka had about a new government, about a new, uh, you know, prime minister, uh, was clearly addressed very soon after, as you remember the visit and all of that that happened. Subsequently, now, as I said, the kind of it's, I mean, there are many, many gaps, and we won't get into that. It's as I, though I do agree that this is the best time ever. We've never seen a thing. But in terms of the lines of credit, I'm giving you a very few examples. Uh, 7.8, I think, on paper. Uh, last, I think, Smriti and I were in conference together, and we checked with the Bangladeshi Foreign Ministry. Less than 2 billion had been, you know, uh, given over and in fact implemented. Now the problems are many. Uh, if you speak to our, our ministry, they will tell you, oh, they didn't give us the projects and the BPR has been lying on the table. They will tell us that these things ready, India didn't offer. So I don't know where the problem is, but on the ground, it's been from 2010 to 2024 on the promised seven plus billion, we've not even given them two billion. But that does not mean that India has not been supporting them. A lot of cross-border facilities that has been built. In fact, India and Bangladesh now are positioned almost in the pre-1965 era in terms of the cross-border, whether it's road, whether it's the railway network. And of course, we know many airports have been connected with Dhaka now, the Northeast I, I refer to. Uh, the most important thing that also happened is the access to the Northeast. They gave us transit for sure. We've gone into many agreements with them. They've given us access to Mongla Chittagong, which we need in terms of accessing our Northeast. We've given them 24 hours transit through that chicken road. A lot more things have happened, but many of it that we are discussing has happened on paper. Uh, again, two of us were again on a conference with some places where they were, um, you know, the transporters and the logistical companies. They told us, and this is exactly a year ago, that even now we are still using the old circuitous route. So while on paper we say multimodal system is in place, transit is in place, they are not being used. One of the problems are, on, again, as you know, each one of us refused to accept our own problem. That's something which is a pattern, typical thing for South Asia, and India is no different. Uh, clearly, the lot of infrastructure facilities being made and successfully built and developed. But many of the, which we say is the last mile connection hasn't been done. Uh, the illegal regime is not in place, firstly and foremost, for you to move your transport. Uh, the technical systems are not in place. So while for many of us, and both for both Bangladesh and India, we've ticked the box. Yes, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, but are we using it? So that's something I think we need to examine in greater details and why are we not using it and where is the problem here? Uh, we have had, as I said, I think once security issues were addressed, we've been able to do a lot more things. Let me just touch upon a bit of the issues that were touched by both by the chair and Dr. Uh, Gupta. Uh, he mentioned about the Bangladeshi saying that it's a relationship of blood. I think it took a military government in Bangladesh to formally first acknowledge India's role in the liberation war. So let's not put ourselves about what Bangladesh thinks about India. I think, you know, it have to have a reality check. So while that has happened from 2010 onwards, and exactly we've had 50 years of Bangladesh, where it was 50 years of bilateral relationship, it's been an unprecedented uh, development of, you know, uh, shall I say, um, enjoying each other's achievement. I think what Bangladesh has been able to do in terms of economic growth is something that India is extremely uh, happy about and able to work together with. But what has happened now, as we see, a large section of Bangladesh is, and while there is now for the first time museum, celebrations, many other occasions to, you know, uh, to celebrate the 50 years together, population which was part of the liberation struggle who have looked up to India who have you know had faith in India is slowly and steadily moving out the younger generation have clearly very little 
emotional connect with the liberation war. We of course know that's part of history. The mention here was of people to people connect. Two of us were growing up, literally we cut our teeth on the you know issues of South Asia. Something that we saw in India, and I, I think a lot of my work has been premised on that, is the track to um, activities that we used to be part of constantly. I think if we're joking where we used to work, that these people are constantly jumping in and out of different countries in South Asia on track to. Ever since, I would say, the last two terms that we've seen this government, there has been a singularly lack of those track to items. Uh, and I'm very happy to hear uh, Viru Gupta sir saying this, that they want to take this across. Uh, there has been a sense here that the government knows it all. So, you know, we are in touch with the real people. Today, like I said, and I, I teach Bangladesh, I teach South Asia in my university. Wherever I go, I, you know, try and raise Bangladesh in parts of India. And I'm saying this, whether it's in Bangalore, where I go quite often. Northeast had seven centers that had opened the Northeast who obviously have a connect with Bangladesh. Even there, the depth of knowledge of Bangladesh was limited. Even talking about other universities, Maharashtra and all that, even in Bengal. I've just come back a week ago delivering a talk on South Asia and Bengal, where I understand the understanding of Bangladesh is really low. They understand there's a country like that. We have that kind of trade going on. And, you know, there's some uh, negative spin out. But on the contrary, every youth in Bangladesh, whether it's the urban Bangladesh, it's the rural Bangladesh, knows anything and everything about India. They are, I mean, I almost say it's obsessive knowledge about India. So it's not only about, you know, uh, it, it, it matches, it's about fashion, it's about music, it's about politics, it's about every data that you want. Actually, a Bangladeshi youth will give you that. But alongside with that, they also have constantly expressed the disappointment in the way they see it. The main factor between, on bilateral, just as I said, because of security consideration, India was able to do a lot. From Bangladesh's point of view, the foremost factor that they have in terms of bilateral relation is water. Uh, the way we see it, the water agreement has still to be signed. We have the Ganges water, which was happened in 1996, up for renewal next year, but Tista wasn't signed. Now we can keep going, you know, I'm from Bengal, so I do understand the issue of Tista. I've seen Tista when it was like a boggling river to a little stream now. So I know what I'm saying in terms of terms. And I've argued vociferously sitting in Dhaka that just because we did not sign an agreement doesn't mean the water flow is not going. The water flow continues. The problem is actually during the lean season. And two friendly countries who are working so much on partnership have not been able to address that. And it's not only the Tista. In terms of, they had wanted 54 rivers, umbrella agreement possible any hydrologist will tell you that doesn't make sense so we had agreed in 2010 joint communique that a basin wise agreement we should sign where are we on that as far as i know it's all paperwork there's nothing that's happened on paper so here it is that something and it's not that the life has come to a standstill because the water or the lack of water flows from india but it's an emotive content again in Foreign policy, you realize it's not really the tangible on the ground. The kind of energy trade that we have in Bangladesh with Bangladesh is unprecedented. Uh, they have huge shortfall, and we've been able to address that. So many issues that we've been able to address. That's not the point. The point is a lot of perception is in play here. People to people connect right now is almost negligible. Uh, I will challenge anyone to pick up a phone and talk to anybody who's not part of your Avamili counterpart. Uh, right now, and I'll you know close in here with this by saying that we've had seen an extremely one-sided election in Bangladesh. Uh, we all understand as to why India supported that election. I think we are in no doubt about the fact that we believe that Sheikh Hasina is the one who upholds a secular fabric in Bangladesh. She's also the one who will completely and most robustly address our security concerns. But that is our problem, right? That's not Bangladesh's issue. The way we see the Bangladesh government has unraveled, and that's true for any government which stays its top uh, and more. Uh, we've had three elections in Bangladesh which are completely one-sided, and rightly or wrongly, there's a very strong perception in Bangladesh that much of that happened because India supported it. If India stood up and said, sorry, boss, this is not working, they would have done something else. He has done many things in terms of a constitutional amendment, in terms of making a much more secular, introducing a secular fabric, which had been unraveled by the previous military leaders. But he's also constricted 
the country to many ways. And that is not something which is lost on the people. So right now, I mean, in terms of illegal migration, that's a subject that we've never, I mean, we talk about friendship, partnership, and all kinds of words, but where is the conversation about that? How many times we've done studies to say that that has to be now? So is NRC and CA, uh, you know, uh, want to address it? Strictly not. Every time I've gone to the neighborhood, again, Sriti and I are constantly jumping in and out. There's not a single neighbor who's told us they're happy with any of this. So as we are thinking that we are taking care of the minority issue. They don't think so. They, the, the minorities themselves don't think so. So what are we doing here? I'm not understanding that if you want to be able to address their core issue. Uh, drug trafficking and all of that is a huge problem. We know there's a complete nexus of mafia on both sides. Uh, please don't tell me that our security forces can't handle it. Clearly, there's something else beyond that, which meets our eye, right? The uh, the shootouts that happen on the border, even today, the numbers are less. We can argue that. From, you know, 215, 10 years ago, now the number is 16 in a year. And we also say the Indians part of it, because we can't make out who's a Bangladeshi and an Indian. But why should there be a shootout between two friendly neighbors? What is the message that we are conveying? Um, we, we've often, I, mean, I think that's a very good point that we have made about what is our obsession with China? I mean, and that's a joke amongst all of us who work in Bangladesh that at some point of time, now, of course, India is there as a large, you know, presence. Uh, the infrastructure development Bangladesh needed, China fulfilled. Uh, nine bridges over the rivers they desperately needed. I mean, we used to joke that every road which is, doesn't have a pothole has been built by China. And Unfortunately, while we keep arguing this case about China in the neighborhood, Bangladesh has not got onto your debt crisis problem. And they will not. They've got into a rabbit hole in the economy, that's a matter. That's because of their own corruption issue and other misgovernance. But they do not have a problem with China the way that we want them to think that they have. So, I mean, I'm going to wrap up here by saying that, yes, education and aspiration of people is something that we also just mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, while we share the best relationship right now, and it's never been better, it's unprecedented levels, we are not addressing the aspiration of people of Bangladesh. Indians are not concerned. We have bigger fish to fry. But in terms of a neighborhood, for Bangladesh, and I think I always say this, that Bangladesh love to hate India. They are, you know, we are somehow umbilically caught attached and they will not let go of that no matter what. Right now, the way we see it, how are we address? I mean, you know, bring forward a legacy of a government which is extremely repressive, extremely authoritarian, has slashed out anything which reeks of liberalism in that country. And we are happy to support that government only on the basis that she's the only one who understands the needs. I'm sorry it doesn't work like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shirada. Mm -hmm. I think you raised some extremely valid and important uh, issues. Um, uh, perceptions, of course, are extremely important. And uh, you're right uh, that they aren't... Uh, uh, requisite people-to-people uh, -people contacts uh, between India and Bangladesh. And uh, given the fact that we are neighbors, we have a, a strong uh, cultural, common cultural background, and it's still, um, I mean, not everything can be supported by the government. Um, chat 2, is it required? Uh, you said that um, when the governments have themselves uh, are enjoying uh, unprecedented level of uh, good relationship, then I don't think track two is required. Uh, but people to people connections have to be there. Um, and, and there are several unresolved issues which uh, Mark and IG had also referred to. Uh, so at this stage, I'd like to invite um, Ambassador Veena Sikri. Uh, she was, uh, she had a very distinguished uh, career uh, as an Indian Foreign Service officer, served in many countries. Um, uh, I met her for the first time in Nepal. Um, yeah, that was my first posting and she was my boss <laughs> in Nepal. And um, um, then, of course, she went on to serve as the um, India's High Commissioner, very active uh, High Commissioner of India in Bangladesh. Um, so she understands the relationship uh, uh, from, a, from a perspective which, of course, none of us have. Uh, and um, I'm sure she would be able to shed uh, very important light on 
how she sees the relationship developing, um, what are the opportunities and what the challenges are. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Master Gupta for uh, the wonderful introduction and uh, thank Chairman uh, Dr. Rai for his introduction as well. Uh, thank, thank you for inviting me to this uh, important discussion and for organizing it actually because uh, I think with our neighbors it's important to, to uh, discuss them, understand them and uh, to what I, whatever extent possible, make sure they understand us. That is a big thing because um, uh, you know meeting each other, having people to people is good, of course, it's necessary, it needs to be done. The most important point is that you should understand us and we should understand their negative aspects and positive aspects and similarly, vice versa. Let me just go back a little bit. I think um, one of the important points um, we forget in the liberation war, actually the key turning point uh, was the 1965 Umar Pakistan war. That was really the key turning point. And actually to understand um, what had happened in uh, India-Bangladesh relations is really to look at what happened in the 1965 war. So from the Bangladesh side, the perspective was that in the 1965 war, for the first time, uh, we were East Pakistan, of course, at that time. And for the first time, they were completely abandoned by West Pakistan. So West Pakistan was in such a, a terrible situation because of the India-Pakistan conflict. And they withdrew every single soldier from uh, East Pakistan and took it to the West for uh, fighting. And uh, they were left completely defenseless. Not only soldiers, there was no telecommunication link, no telephone, no fax, nothing. No communication for the outside world, for the people of East Pakistan. All that time, those three weeks or so, in 1965 during the war. But that was actually the turning point for the people of Bangladesh. They realized that it could not work anymore with West Pakistan. And they could not actually uh, survive a situation where could be abandoned again, you know, and left entirely to your resources. And two things um, uh, happened for them. First, they realized they could not be with West Pakistan. And from now on, it was a very different kind of a struggle, more and more focus on the six-point program and so on. And the second thing they realized, that actually, they can trust India. Because uh, India did nothing. India, it never occurred to anybody in India to think that we could, you know, either walk into East Pakistan or take it over or trouble them through East Pakistan. No, we didn't, we didn't, it didn't occur in in our strategic calculations at all because we didn't consider the people of East Pakistan as enemies or as, you know, somebody with whom uh, we wanted to have uh, uh, differences. So, so two important points embedded in the uh, Bangladesh mind. And from the India perspective, what happened um, after the 65 war, which was very good for us, of course, we won the war. Uh, but what happened in retaliation by West Pakistan, they cut off all links for India with East Pakistan, the millennia old connections, whether it was by rail, whether it by water, whether it was by road, they have never stopped for millennia. It had never, it has always been interaction, always been coming and going. Till 1952, you didn't even need a passport, you know, you could walk in and out. It was, uh, but till 65, after 65, completely lost. So it was like, you know, you draw a big curtain and now you cannot enter that area. So it was um, a great, a block for India because it also blocked off Northeast India. So that was a big situation that India had to face with. And I think uh, from that point on, we did realize that with East Pakistan, security is the most important issue. Security and connectivity. These were <clears> the <throat> most important issues. And till today, till today, we're actually repairing and restoring connectivity that was stopped in 1965. Till today, even Sheikh Hasina in her last speech also said that. You know, that I have this chart saying what was connected in off in 1965 and we are almost there, but not quite there yet. So we still haven't been able to restore those links uh, uh, which were there pre-1965. So this is, a, you know, a, a mindset which has been there for Pakistan, which we have to understand. Just through that, okay, um, thanks to uh, uh, the uh, very good understanding uh, Ever since uh, Sheikh Tina has been Prime Minister from 2009 onwards, uh, it has been quite remarkable the way the, in which relations have developed. The last 10 years have been particularly um, productive because of the focus on implementation. You know, the agreements were taken 
some time back, even if you take the land boundary agreement, you know, signing something and actually implementing it on the ground are two very different things. But now with the focus has been very much on implementation and uh, that has led to a great deal of uh, goodwill uh, among the people of India and Bangladesh. I, I don't quite agree with what Sridhar says about uh, Sheikh Hasina and the Iwami League. Um, I think if I go back to the two issues of security and connectivity, then Sheikh Hasina has provided both. So when a person is willing to provide you what you need as the most important factors, in the relationship, then there is no reason why you should not want that relationship to continue. And secondly, as far as the BNP itself is concerned, they are the ones who boycotted the elections. I mean, this time, I can say for sure that if they had taken part, they would have got an anti incumbency vote. And they just decided on their own, I think it was a wrong decision completely on their part, uh, to not take part. And they did it once before also, the same thing with Sheikh Hasina. So, um, I think that uh, we have to uh, give the credit where it's due. And if there is this, uh, if Sheikh Hasina has won the, of course, uh, also this talk that some people were from Sheikh Hasina but fighting in the opposition, all that is the local uh, thing. I'm not going to go to all of that. But the fact is that she uh, has been able to bring the people together and she realizes the importance of um, the good relationship with India for the people of Bangladesh. This is where I think we have to understand what she is doing. I consider Sheikh Hasina as a staunch nationalist, and she is doing it really for the interests of Bangladesh. So her foreign policy, uh, malice towards none, friendship with all, uh, means that you know she'll be friends with India, she'll be friends with China, everybody. Uh, but she definitely thinks that as far as security issues are concerned, we have not benefit the people of Bangladesh to have uh, you know insurgent groups from Northeast India based in their country. And so she did away with them. I can tell you that when I, mean, I was high commissioner there, it was uh, in P years, Begum Khaldazia was the prime minister. And every single terrorist attack in India in those three years had a Bangladeshi footprint. Every single. Either you found the person, you know, sometimes they found that his chapel was bought in Bangladesh. You know, the terrorist sometimes drew himself up when they found that even the chapel or something, or they found something that he had come from Bangladesh. So Every single terrorist incident in India in those years, which of course we blamed on Pakistan, but it had a Bangladeshi footprint. It was coming through Bangladesh, and Bangladesh was the great source of um, um, easy access for Pakistani terrorists to India. Every plane went from uh, Pakistan, there were at least two or three flights a week from Pakistan to Dhaka, from either Lahore or Karachi or Islamabad. And um, in every flight, it was served at that time. At least when people walked in without any papers, they were allowed, it was all fixed up. And they would come, they would enter Bangladesh and then work into India, such a porous border. And from India, they would go off maybe to Kashmir, maybe to other parts, whatever they were uh, asked to do by their handlers. They didn't. And so I think uh, when you compare those times and see what is now the situation, that at least on security issues, uh, you have uh, here chit. Uh, you can understand the importance. Here, I must immediately <coughs> pay attention to the fact that uh, you think that um, Pakistan has given up, it has not. It is still very active in Bangladesh and uh, they are fomenting radicalization, they are fomenting uh, you know, extremism at the grassroots level. Uh, they are working through the Jamaat Islami, which is a party which has uh, you know, been founded by by the Maulana, the, uh, who uh, you know founded both the all the Jamaat Islamis of the entire subcontinent, uh, and uh, he, and uh, they have very close connections, and so the fomenting of anti-Indianism and uh, pro radicalization commitment to form of religion that is quite different from the secularism which is envisaged in the Bangladesh Constitution. Uh, what was going on at full stream and for nothing else at least for this reason uh, we have to understand that we have to have far closer relations with the people of Bangladesh than we have at the moment. Actually we have an excellent government to government relationship, perhaps the best in the world and no doubt the government of India has some wonderful programs of encouraging uh, people of different groups to visit India. There are journalists who come every year, there are students who come every year uh, they're brought in big groups, they're taken to different parts of India. A lot of Bangladesh students get scholarships, I think at least 300 a year, um, if not more. 
uh, and they come and study. Special scholarships have been awarded. So all this is there. But what it has done for the feelings of the people of Bangladesh towards India uh, is not very clear. Because today, as we speak, uh, after the election, after Bangladesh, uh, after Sheikh Hasina got elected recently, there was, you know, another India Out campaign, which started not by Rami League, of course, not by the BNP. I'm not interested in the BNP side. The, the interest is whether it has an impact or not. At the, uh, whether there are resonance to this in uh, uh, Bangladesh. Basically, there is no resonance, so I don't think it will impact in any way uh, the relationship between India and Bangladesh. I don't think we have to worry about that. Because that relationship is going well, but uh, but um, at the grassroots level, you know why is it going on? Why are they uh, trying to create this kind of anti Indianism? And in fact, I was surprised to see that uh, in response to this, uh, a lot of comments in the Bangladesh media where they say that, oh well, you know this anti it's just a silly campaign; it'll not have any impact. So, you know there is some anti Indianism inherent in the Bangladesh DNA. So it's a kind of a feel on the cause uh, between 47 and 71. There was so much of, uh, you know, uh, brainwashing, I would say, anti-Indian brainwashing, that it's lasted. But generation is gone or going, you know. And still, at the younger generation now, a new wave of anti-Indianism has come in to attack, to bring in their, to change their feelings at the grassroots level, at the young students level. So we have to uh, be very, very careful about this and we have to uh, pay a lot of attention to it. It is not something to be ignored because unless you have the people on your side, uh, you cannot really. In Maldives, sort for of example, it was heartening to see, although now the elections have been held and he's lost the parliament, I mean, Muizu has won the parliamentary election, the other side has lost. But still, you did see institutions in Maldives coming out and saying, look, we think good relations with India is a good thing. You know, that whether it was the tourist association or the trade association or uh, some individuals and so on, former president. Um, uh, in, in Bangladesh, it's a little different. I think we have to be very careful. And on in Bangladesh, even today, right from the time when I was there, the campaign against India on financial sharing uh, goes on remarkably, very, very brilliantly. Uh, the campaign on killing at the border, quite devoid of uh, really any touch with reality, because um, I would say that uh, on Tista, um, it's very clear that there is an agreement which has been initialed, only have, with percentages, no amount of water. So if you're saying 40% of water will go to Bangladesh, 40% of what? I mean, with 40% of 100 liters, 1,000 liters, a million liters, you don't know, because nobody has measured the water flowing in the Tista. And the Ganga Waters Treaty has been an excellent example of a treaty based on records that the British kept of the actual flows in the Ganga at Faraka and, you know, at different points um, where it was flowing. So it was really easy to come to a decision on what water uh, Bangladesh was getting before. So how much should they get as a percentage in the coming, in the year? It's worked well, but I'm sure the renewal is going to be a little tricky uh, because they're going to maybe um, uh, up the demand. There's a lot of talk in Bangladesh on that right now. But on Tista, what we need to insist on, and I've been saying this for 15 years, but not any impact, we need to do a joint hydrological survey. We need to have a clear understanding because the British kept records on the Ganga, so what can be accepted? Okay, the British keep these records, this is okay. We go by this. But on Tista, there's nothing. So on what basis can you agree? Uh, otherwise, the people of West Bengal will go up in arms, uh, as uh, Mamta Mataji has very successfully engineered, uh, that there will be a strong opposition, you know, within Bengal. So um, I think if you have a joint hydrological survey, then there is no two ways about it. You know how much water there is and how much can possibly be shared. And in the meanwhile, while we are still negotiating this and talking about joint hydrological surveys, all the water is going to Bangladesh. So there is no limit at the moment because all the water that's there is just going there. There's nothing, even the uh, canal system that, uh, uh, you know, we, we uh, West Bengal has a 30 year old promise of an irrigation system, a canal system, etc., built in the northern part of Bengal, West Bengal where there's very little flows. That's never been uh, completed. I think even the land acquisition has not been completed for that. So we go on talking about it, but it hasn't been done. And in the meanwhile, the water is all going um, into Bangladesh. So I think that um, this is what we have to, um, you know, be very 
we should talk about this and talk to everybody about it. That why is it that you're hungry on this and so on? And you know, killings at the border, they are very few, but even if one person dies for 10 days in the Bangladesh media, you'll have nothing else. And we have to be conscious about that. I used to tell our BSF people, why not you get together with the BGB and come out with a report and what happened? So there was, it was a smuggler. It was somebody who was trying to get inside, smuggle cattle or gold or something else. A lot of gold smuggling takes place at the Bangladesh border. Um, so, you know, we have to um, talk about these problems and make sure that we have an understanding with Bangladesh on that. And I think that... Um, if we get them to understand what it is all about, security is very important, connectivity is very important, because if we access Northeast through Bangladesh, it is Bangladesh who will benefit. Their companies are doing the connectivity, their companies are doing the trading, you know, and, and uh, they will get business in the Northeast. And it's a very prosperous region. Uh, people are very well educated. It's a very good region to do business in. So I think these um, um, factors have to be explained. And finally, just one word on the China factor. And um, uh, China is playing a very nasty game in all India's neighborhood. It doesn't matter whether it is Bangladesh or Nepal or Sri Lanka or, of course, Pakistan. Uh, so I think that um, uh, uh, for a long time, we had this attitude, okay, let China do what they want. We, we will, you know, sort of um, go ahead, doesn't matter. But I think the, it has become very serious now. Bangladesh, uh, China, you know, uh, game for China. They see anything uh, which uh, you know that favors India as going against them. They see anything that favors USA as going against them. For example, when the when the uh, Bangladesh government recently issued a paper on the Indo-Pacific outlook, you know, it was a very good paper, very balanced paper, and uh, China took it to mean that. Uh, uh, Bangladesh is now in favor of Quad and in favor of joining the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And so it made them very angry. The Chinese ambassador, which is beyond all diplomatic protocol, actually made a statement in Dhaka saying that, I would tell Bangladesh that if they get closer to Quad or if they get closer to, uh, you know, this, uh, it's not good for our bilateral relations, Bangladesh-China bilateral relations. So uh, uh, they are very... Uh, on uh, very strong on this and we have to recognize that bangladesh's entire defense commitment is with china entire we have given them a 5 billion uh, no sorry half a billion 500 million 500 million half a billion dollar uh, credit line on defense matters it's virtually unutilized because china doesn't want them to do any defense uh, deal with india china does not want them to buy anything from india and uh, not even civilian all codes, and you know, not even ordnance factories. So um, uh, they, it's a very sensitive point. India would like to have more close defense uh, cooperation with uh, Bangladesh, but China doesn't allow it. So I think we have to be very careful on this. And there are many times where China does cross the security line, forces Bangladesh to cross the security red lines uh, that India has for Bangladesh. And we have had to come in and put in a lot of and get this. Uh, so all these issues are not only to be discussed at uh, the top government to government level, which it is, and, and where there is a good understanding, so it is all right. Uh, but I think there's an understanding to be created. You can't talk many details at other levels. There's an understanding to be created that, you know, uh, uh, what is it that you want from China? Whereas today in Bangladesh, everybody is cheering Sheikh Hasina because they think she's developing good relations with China. You know, and they see this great balancing between India and China, and they see this great victory for uh, Sheikh Hasina. From their point of view, it's a different matter. But for India, for our security interests, uh, it's a different perspective entirely. As we've seen even in Sri Lanka, uh, where, you know, where Hamban Tota port went away, was given to China in a 99-year lease. But then when the crisis came for Sri Lanka, only India was there to help them. Uh, you know, countries like China, countries like Pakistan, they never give up. So we've given the $4 billion, they've taken it, they've got the IMF loan, but China is back again there, you know, signing more agreements, doing things in Trincomalee, doing things in other places. So it's a very dynamic situation. It's not that you've got more relations with Sheikh Hasina, you can sit back and say, no, not at all. There's a lot of work to be done and we should be ready to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veena. Uh, I think clearly there is no room for complacency. <laughs> this relationship is far too important for us. Uh, there are very important security concerns. And happily, the Bangladesh government today is addressing 
those concerns uh, more actively as uh, compared to the past. Uh, I think your suggestion for a joint hydrological survey of the Tiesta waters appears to be very good and um, should be taken up by um, our government agencies. Um, you know, there are, there are issues. There are religious radicalization. Uh, historically, there are, there are groups of people um, and organizations which are antithetical to India's interest. And they will, obviously, they will be um, uh, campaigns, uh, deliberate campaigns run by those quarters. So I think we have to be prepared for that um, and uh, take it forward. I think today, if I'm not wrong, uh, Bangladesh enjoys uh, very good uh, per capita income, yeah. probably higher than that of India. For a while, it will be higher. Almost similar. So I think this issue of illegal immigration and a lot of Bangladeshis coming to India, that problem has by itself been resolved because um, uh, at one point in time, people used to come to India for insight of jobs, but if there is better income in Bangladesh, uh, things will not happen. I mean, you know, there are neighboring countries and there are these issues. Um, I think very importantly, the, the um, point that you made about how uh, the governments in 65 won impacted. I wasn't aware of that uh, myself. Uh, that how it changed the perception of people in Bangladesh, uh, particularly towards India. Uh, I think uh, it, it's amazing that uh, in, in a full growing war between India and Pakistan, why did India not uh, and occupy a lot of territories in uh, East Pakistan? I thought the way we love it. India and East Pakistan, the war between India and Pakistan. So if uh, Western Front had happened, uh, we could have opened the Eastern Front, uh, which would have been work even at this time for us. So I think that led to uh, in percent of women in trust for India in, in Bangladesh, and you can still see remnants of that. So thank you very much for uh, this very important perspective. And uh, the last speaker uh, we have, uh, last but not the least, uh, Ms. Pratip Patnaik. Um, she is a senior fellow at the uh, Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. And for many years, in fact, um, from um, I think last uh, 20 years plus, uh, been, um, she's been dealing with uh, our neighboring region very active member of the South Asia cluster, which does a lot of work. In fact, this institute, uh, more than 50% of its work is on South Asia. And um, uh, Spoti uh, was an active contributor to, uh, during my days at IDSA. Um, I think I depended a great deal on uh, her understanding of uh, particularly Nepal and uh, Bangladesh. So I think we're very happy that you've accepted our invitation to come. And um, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, introduction. And already my other panelists have spoken about uh, a lot on the various developments. So therefore, as a last speaker, there is not much to say. But having said that, just uh, I'll make some few points. One is that uh, I think no other country impact Bangladesh the manner in which India does. If you look at the geography, uh, for example, if there is a flood uh, or drought in Bangladesh, India is responsible because ma'am ma and Sri Radha were speaking of the water issues. Because uh, Bangladesh is generally treat that uh, the Faraka gate can be closed like a door uh, in the house. So you open the door, that's why we had flood, it closed the door, we are not getting water. There is a particular manner in which the door closes and opens. But for the general public, uh, probably the impression comes from how to do it at home. Uh, second issue is that uh, many of the mammals you spoke about, you spoke about the 71 war. I think uh, to understand the dynamics of the bilateral relations, perhaps we need to look into the liberation war, the factism that existed within the liberation war. Uh, people who fought uh, as part of the uh, Mukh Bahini, part of Mujib Bahini, 
uh, and also the government in exile, the relationship between the government of uh, government in exile and Mujibahini, which was uh, led by uh, Sheikh Moni, which who was uh, Mujib's nephew, uh, who had a different idea about how the liberation war would be fought. Uh, so this factionalism needs to be understood to actually understand uh, the post-71 developments in uh, Bangladesh and why Muji was so popular uh, at that point of time completely fell out by the end of 74-75, uh, of course, uh, in August he was killed. Second issue is that probably we don't take into consideration those people who opposed the liberation of Bangladesh, those people who, in fact, supported the Pakistan regime. They are very much there within Bangladesh, and therefore the assumption that liberation was changed everything in uh, you know in Bangladesh. So therefore, Bangladesh should be very supportive of uh, the kind of role which India played in 71. Actually, when you look at those actors, then you actually know that why the relationship did not develop the manner in which uh, India had expected. Second issue is the 15 years of the military rule from 75 to 1990. And uh, the repatriated soldiers who came back from Pakistan and also the, you know, I think, uh, Ashad. So they ruled the country. And that actually to the evening out of the freedom fighter officers and the dominance of the these people who came from Pakistan. So they had particular perspective of India. They did not fight the liberation war. So they really do not know what kind of role India played in 1971. So those actually acted uh, to a very large extent um, in impacting the bilateral uh, relations between the two countries. Apart from that, of course, uh, you know, many of the issues which has been already discussed, uh, you know, by both uh, other panelists. Uh, one is the border killing. So, you know, that impacts like anything, you know, if you are a friend, you played a role in our liberation. So how is it that you are killing our people? So that is one of the issues which always comes up because, uh, you know, it always appears as if the Bangladeshis are getting killed. There is no news about any Indian being killed who is involved in the border. So it becomes a kind of, you know, then second issue is that many of the Bangladeshis will also tell you that your BSF, which is posted in Kashmir and other areas, they come from that area, therefore they come and food. So you have to tell them it's not for them from a hard posting, it is a much softer posting. When you speak to BSF, they will tell you, when we are in this border, we really don't know how to, are they enemy, are they friends? So half of the time, we are not able to understand this particular dynamics. So that actually makes a lot of arts to the Indianism, which is there. As I said, the remnant of uh, 71 opposed to the liberation war are there. Then you have this border killing, flagged by some of the Dhaka newspaper all the time. That yes, India says it is zero killing in the border. India says it is rubber bullet. So all the time India promises something, but it does not deliver. So it adds to the delivery deficit in in that sense. But when you explain it to them, the rubber bullet fired at a particular range will kill a person, depending on where. In any case, in a smuggling time, uh, you know the other person is also trying to hide and do the so. When you speak to the BSF, they say, by the time we fire, if the person ducks. So, you know, this entire thing of firing at leg is not, you know, actually, uh, you know, you can't operate that particular principle. And moreover, the assumption is that most of these smugglers are unarmed. They're armed. So that is something often we always don't say. So it appears like, you know, saying Bangladesh is smugglers, even if smugglers, so what, you, have, you can't kill. So that kind of narrative actually is very much dominant in Dhaka, but you don't have a counter narrative uh, from India, which will, uh, in fact, counter this kind of narrative. Third issue also, when, you know, about the border crossing. In, in fact, in Benapol and Zapol, the manner in which people are also, the Bangladeshis, Rest by the police, open this suitcase, show me what you are taking. So it actually uh, adds to the kind of anti Indianism. Probably, uh, maybe we should do training uh, to how to deal with it. This is what the elite don't face. The elite come by flight very nicely in the immigration phase two courses and gone because I, so I was crossing the Benapol Petrapol. Each time the policeman will come and ask, Okay, you know, open this suitcase. Some of the time people pack it in such a manner, you know, you are coming by road, you pack it 
completely packed. So you can't open it, opening, and they're crying in that small room to, to again put everything back. And again, you are pushing them that you go out, if you know, so, you know, it adds uh, to, you know, to the kind of anti-Indian feeling because that is the personal experience is taking that from India that he was not treated well when he arrived in India. Though, of course, uh, many people come from medical tourism, probably the highest we get uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, another issue about the narrative building is also, which I can add, is the Waj Mahifils. Uh, you know, uh, you have this Waj in most of the villages. So you can, they, these days they put the mic also. So they keep on uh, basically discussing what is happening to the Muslims around the world. So in many of the time you will hear uh, what is happening to the minorities in India. So kind of thing which goes around. So therefore that adds that, okay, you know, this is how the minority has been being treated. It's very different. You know, I've always tried to, like for example, we Indians, when a Nepali gets attacked for us, it's a Nepali. We don't think in terms of Hindu getting attacked. But, but for the Muslim, their, uh, you know, their way of conceiving this particular attack is always the Muslims are being attacked. So therefore, that also adds uh, to the kind of narrative. And of course, the election which happened in Dhaka just recently. So there is a very strong belief that India could have stopped or could have facilitated democracy in the neighborhood. So that there is an expectation that, uh, you know, you should have done something, uh, you know, to stop Hasina if Hasina is, you know, implementing the Digital Security Act under which many of the journalists are, are arrested. You should pressure, you should, as if, you know, the entire onus of governing Bangladesh is on India's shoulders. Sometimes you really feel like that. Sometimes you argue with them that, uh, you know, your prime minister is completely, anybody who knows Sheikh Hasina, ma'am knows, so it's in complete control. She delivered the election. You, even if you don't support the internal mechanisms she had put in place, even if she would not have wanted, the election she would have won. You know, the answers. Bureaucrats, everybody wanted her because you know their interest is very much interlinked. So, because of this interlinking of the interest of the domestic actors as well as Dominic, there is nothing which India could have done. Why should it do in the sense that if if we our national interest is being fulfilled, I always tell them, would you do? Would you remove someone if the person is serving your interest? You won't. So why should India, you know, I have not been able to understand why should India do, and probably the greatest facilitation was done by um, by not participating. Even the visa regime restriction which the Americans had put, if you participated in the election, if there is any violence, obstruction of their participation, probably the visa regime would have come to place. That did not happen. And the only thing uh, which I want to add and end, there is a lot of uh, structure that has come up in the last 10 years as far as the bilateral relations is concerned. Like, for example, you have uh, dialogue at the level of foreign secretary where you, you know, they look at the JRC. Uh, they use, of course, JRC is their, uh, you know, joint uh, council which looks after the implementation of the project. You have also dialogue between the home minister, uh, the secretary, uh, the meeting between uh, the SP superintendent of police between of the two sites, especially in the border area where taking ad advantage of the police border, many people cross the border. You also have DC level meeting in the border areas. You have uh, several military exercises, the Sampriti series of exercises. You have uh, naval uh, exercise. And of course, uh, Bangladesh is observer in the Colombo security uh, conflict, which was earlier the trilateral between Sri Lanka, uh, India and Maldives. And also at the same time, uh, you know, it's not just the bilateral, you know, the structuring of the bilateral relations, which I think is very, very significant. Now we have structures at place, but of course, whether the structure will work, not work, it's a different issue. Because you can take a hot river, but can't make it drink water. So therefore, the structure is not uh, sufficient. But also at the same time, what has happened in the last uh, 10 to 15 years is that you know, it is now confined to having the bilateral lesson, only bilateral. We'll do a bilateral, which one used to hear very often, probably in the 90s. Now you have a lot of trilaterals. Like, for example, you have, you know, this BPIN, of course, it's a quadrilateral kind of thing. You also have uh, with, uh, on the Ganges, cooperation, you have Nepal, Bangladesh, and India. On Brahmaputra, you have Bhutan, Bangladesh, and India. So there is a lot of uh, interlinking uh, relationship so therefore in a sense uh, you know it, probably it will 
provide a kind of lifeline which we are seeing uh, in terms of uh, what is happening between the two countries probably to continue and it, uh, you know the building of the relationship is such the investment is such because like for example uh, we have this uh, high impact community development uh, programs uh, which is basically you know training library village roads and all which actually is very impactful so india moved on from a very uh, a kind of relationship government to government relationship we are more visible in terms of our projects which is not the case probably 10 years back uh, wherever you will go you will say india uh, sorry bangladesh uh, china friendship this bangladesh china this in all the countries now at least you have visible projects uh, in bangladesh and also at the same time, you are engaging the people. Several scholarships are being given. The only thing is that how do you leverage the scholarship giving to the students who are coming to India? So sometimes I feel that probably we have not been able to leverage those students who are our actual ambassador in Bangladesh who can speak for us. Uh, there is a disconnect. Uh, we need to adopt the American way. So once uh, you have been on any government program in the U.S., they will always keep in touch with you, which actually you know, we have been much more of a French way. Uh, you know, they will give you scholarship, everything after that, you know, you really don't know who the students are, who benefited from you. Call them annually, give them dinner or, you know, a kind of reception, meet them, see who is doing what. Can we tap into those people whom we provided scholarship uh, who are in a much bigger position? So we are doing this bureaucracy training and all. But I think that probably will be very, very significant in, uh, you know, taking uh, this particular bilateral relationship uh, forward. So I'll just end here. Thank you. Thank you, Smriti. Um... I think very good suggestion to keep in touch with the people who've been here, who've been on RS scholarship. Uh, uh, American ways, of course, we all know, they're very transactional. We don't want to make it look that transactional, but it's still, uh, I think forgetting them altogether is also not the uh, option. Um, the, uh, you know, the question of democracy in our neighborhood, you know, it's a, it's a very contentious issue. And um, uh, many of us in India, we begin to uh, delude ourselves into believing that we have somehow, um, you know, this compelling responsibility uh, to ensure uh, that democracy flourishes. And I think uh, that would amount to, in my view, punching above our weight, we really don't need to bother about it too much. Um, in some cases, uh, Americans put up, put us up to it. Uh, and I think we let the Americans do it if they want to do. Uh, why should we get involved? Um, I think we burnt our bridges already in Myanmar. Um, initially, we completely shut ourselves out with the uh, Janta. Um, and we continue to sulk about you know the the lack of democracy or suppression of democracy only realizing that we can't we couldn't do very much without engaging the janta and i think we corrected course uh, uh, midway um, well i think very comprehensively a lot of issues have been raised i just like to raise one more issue that of the minorities um, uh, in, in arsp we received uh, actually a number of delegations of um, Hindu minorities from uh, Bangladesh um, in the last two, three years. In fact, I myself have uh, uh, interacted with several delegations. And one thing that came across uh, quite clearly in those uh, uh, conversations, that uh, the minorities, the Hindus particularly, continue to suffer uh, in a systematic manner in Bangladesh, irrespective of which government has been there. So I think that uh, one would one would tend to believe that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, kind of oppression or difficulties of the minorities uh, were accentuated during the BNP. But at least the delegations which came, they gave us a totally different impression. They said, you oh, know, it didn't have anything to do with the um, uh, even during uh, Awami League's uh, government, uh, the the uh, you know it has carried on with the same intensity. Um, uh, so I think that is uh, that is a bit surprising. Uh, 
Uh, at one point in time, our view would have been that you know, look, minorities or no minorities, the Bangladeshi nationals, and what is our locus of standi? Uh, but I think the present government uh, has made it uh, its business to talk about uh, uh, the CAA is, of course, uh, a very clear affirmation, and I think many of us uh, do believe in the rationale. Uh, it's an unfinished agenda. There are a lot of people who, who decide to make uh, Bangla East Pakistan their home. Um, and uh, they try. Uh, the uh, their numbers in the percentage terms went down drastically from uh, 47 down to, you know, if you look at 60s, 70s, uh, you know, the very drastic reduction. And that itself uh, points out uh, to the, uh, the fact that. Uh, Know, the kind of difficulties that they must be facing. So I just like to leave with that. Um, we have about 10, 15 minutes to uh, take a few observations or comments. Um, so we have... Um... Yes, sir. Uh, respected guys, brother friends, uh, my point is that we have heard these views, but uh, beyond these personal views, uh, the nation has its own views. We are in safe hands when Mr. S. Jasankar is our. Minister for External Affairs. We have been hearing him quite often in personal capacity on TV, in other conferences and seminars. So, and he implies full confidence from our Prime Minister Modi. Therefore, he talks very boldly, whether it is USA or Canada or even Europe, European Union, or maybe even others. Undoubtedly, China is trying its level best to destabilize the places with our neighbor. There is no doubt about it, whether it is uh, Sri Lanka or it is uh, Bangladesh or Pakistan or for that sake, even Bhutan. And... But our external affairs ministry is fully aware of all these things. And it may not be apparently visible to every citizen of our country, but China will be defeated in its attack. It may take a little time. But certainly, they will not succeed. Thank you very much. Amit, thank you very much, sir. So my query is to please, please restrict yourself to very specific comments on India Bangladesh relations. Fifty nine seconds. Points that have been made by the panelists. Fifty nine seconds. Sir. Thank you. So my my query is to uh, Doctor Tatapis, and uh, as we know that uh, Bangladesh is uh, transiting from this world economy, and it would have its own repercussions per se. Um, I understand when I'm used uh, well while I'm using the term repercussions because the current that they get from European Union and many other countries, it come to a uh, standstill now. Uh, in in the recent time, as Ambassador Gupta sir has mentioned, that's you know the the per capita income has actually increased dramatically. So uh, based on the relationship, the the economic relationship between India and uh, Bangladesh. With their transition and the kind of grants they are be getting, what would be the impact of India Bangladesh relationship in terms of trade and commerce? Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Uh, please introduce yourself. My name is Rajiv Kurana. I'm attending this for the first time, and it's more of a learning experience for me. Thank you very much. Uh, by profession, I'm a management consultant, trainer, and writer. And I also run an NGO called Lung Care Foundation. So you started, uh, Ambassador Gupta, you start with the word mistrust, very vital. And then we also took up the word big brother attitude of India. 
Now, when we talk about relationships, there are two dimensions to that. The top-down approach and the bottoms-up approach. Top-down, government to government, we've been holding all this. But bottoms-up is always evolving. And that's based on multiple factors because I've happened to have trained Bangladeshis in various countries, uh, UAE, Africa, even in Thailand, etc. And we do, I mean, they give us a platter that we are much more uh, maybe knowledgeable or senior than them. In my query is, sir, if we even look at, you know, our bottoms of approach, and we look at businesses which are evolving because majority of the Indian businesses, especially in governments, are running businesses through Bangladesh because of the cost benefit advantage. Similarly, uh, our learning and development is much more stronger, and it is not just the education part, but overall capacity building, even in the aspect of healthcare. And of course, the cultural fabric has also been very, very strong. So my query is, sir, that while the top-down approach needs to be strengthened further, how do we strengthen the bottoms-up approach so that that relationship becomes much more stronger? Yeah. Namaste, my name is Tamu Halina. I'm basically an engineer, but I enjoy discussing such things. In the AFSP, it is my first time. My questions are very simple. Why none of the speakers mentioned the indoctrination by Wahhabis, others, in almost every Muslim country, including India. That's a very important factor for Indian Indians, and uh, it had to be mentioned more clearly. Coming about the perception, again, we put a perception in India under the carpet, which was illegal immigration. but they were all in Indian class. Two minutes. Now, when they have immigration, they have Indians, you are Bangladeshis. How do you say Bangladeshi? I have a history of the passport. They have a history of the passport. One person has not said anything about Hindustan. I have a history of the history of Hindustan. I have a history of the history of Hindustan. I have a history of the history of Hindustan. So, that immigration is not going to be able to get the national passport. Better of perception. Unless we deal with it, we cannot ask any good for as far as the perception addressing is. That's all. Right. I think we will now just say, uh, ask the time scene as well. Yes, sir. Right. Can I ask you to be a first? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the very interesting question. Let me begin with the last one. Perception actually is very important. But I must say that um, I think two issues, as um, Master Gupta said, you know, the issue of uh, illegal immigration we didn't touch upon and the Hindu minorities. I think both are very important issues, you know, and we should not have any hesitation in talking about them. Actually, in the first few decades after independence, um, uh, the views of Prime Minister Nehru were that, uh, you know, if somebody is born abroad and become a citizen of that country, then that's the problem of that country. And he always advised the Indian community everywhere that, look, you know, you are now the citizen of another country, be loyal to that country, and so on. There are problems that immigrants face in those countries, and they need to help. With China, it's the exact opposite view. They consider that every Chinese national anywhere in the world is a Chinese citizen, regardless of the passport he or she holds. I think uh, we uh, have to have a strong... Uh, Middle road on this, and to understand that 
if we have assessed that they are facing a genuine problem, then we should uh, help them. In Bangladesh, the um, Hindu minorities, the basic problem they face is due to the land. We were the landowners um, always traditionally. And still, a lot of them are there in Bangladesh only because of the land that they have. If they didn't have that land, they would have left and gone. It is a lot for the land that keeps them there, the ancestral land and so on. So they're still on there. But that land is such a priceless commodity in Bangladesh, among the most densely populated nations in the world. So there's constant attack on grabbing land. And the laws also, you know, they have these um, acts, uh, the University Property. Property Act, which is there, and Sheikh Hasina had promised to uh, correct all the discrepancy. In fact, the early Property Act was so fair that even if you went to visit abroad, your land could be grabbed. Somebody would have come and occupy your land, and that's it. It's gone. You cannot, people have not got it back. So I think these are issues that we have to take up. We should, in not in an unfriendly way, in a very friendly way. And I think that Bangladesh will lose enormously if their Hindu minority goes away. And of course, the Christian and other minorities are very, very small indeed. But if their Hindu minority go away, they no longer are secular because there's nobody else except the Muslims. Uh, it will really affect the quality of life in their country. And uh, we can know that, you know. And But today, everybody from Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina downwards is you know, appeasing the Wahhabi, appeasing the extremists and coming to terms with them. So it is a very delicate situation. And in fact, it is in Bangladesh's own interest that they should maintain secular view. Sheikh Hasina does intervene. For example, I mean, can you believe our Prime Minister was there, Prime Minister Modi was there uh, in 1921 for the 50th anniversary of uh, the Liberation War. It's remarkable that, you know, he, India and Bangladesh were together in 71, both the leaders and in 2021 also together. There were demonstrations in Bangladesh against him, in the, not in Dhaka, outside uh, Noakhali area, you know. And um, uh, Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina could stop it. But still, the demonstrations took place. And they were determined, uh, arranged by the um, Wahhabis, arranged by the fundamentalists. And they wanted to show. So I think, um, you know, when it comes to that level, then we have to look at the interests of uh, an illegal mi migration, uh, we should not hesitate about talking at all. In fact, we should... I have recommended when I was there 15 years ago, it was a very simple methodology, especially today when we have so much of IT development. But any Bangladesh coming to India, passport, like it is for any citizen, anybody coming, it's recorded on the computer. But there is a special program that if the length of the visa is recorded and that person does not go back when that date is over, there should be a special, uh, what should I say, you know, a, a, a note, a ping, as it were, saying that this person is now an illegal immigrant. And if you have the biometrics of that person, you can trace that person. So, but this program somehow, we, I think we have it with Pakistan to some extent, but not with Bangladesh. So we should introduce, we have to use our own IT skills. And I don't think we've done that to the extent possible. Because it's very easy, actually, that program. So the moment a person has overstayed, that's it. And even if you come and burn your passport or whatever and apply for Indian papers, but your biometrics are there. And now Bangladesh itself has a very good, strong uh, national ID system. Uh, it's an army which maintains that system. Every citizen of Bangladesh is recorded on that system. So it's uh, something to work with the Bangladeshis about. And uh, in fact, you will be surprised to know that the only reference to illegal immigration in any India-Bangladesh document was Panda Khalda in 1991 when she came to India. So, and it was there saying, yes, this is a problem. So in 1991, we were willing to say it's a problem. But now we don't talk about it. And the document says that, yes, it is a problem and it will be solved through dialogue. So why not? We can still do it. So I don't think there's a, in a, in a very friendly spirit, in a spirit of understanding, these problems are there between all neighbors, America and Mexico, America and Canada. These problems are there everywhere in the world. So we should not hesitate to, uh, and I can tell you as far as Bangladesh is concerned, with every country in the world, they have a problem of illegal immigration. In Korea, the biggest groups are the Bangladeshi. In Italy, the biggest groups are Bangladeshi. Uh, Switzerland, every, and they all talk to the Bangladesh government about it. So we should not hesitate, actually. But to India, I'm sorry, uh, it's about infiltration also. Not merely, you know, like overstaying the, on that. The problem is, they just cross over the uh, land border. So no, now it's much better. Those land borders, earlier it was like that. We didn't have fencing. Now we have fencing. It happens everywhere. Yeah, it happens everywhere. Yeah. Like the same, uh, South Africa, 
lot of people from Malawi, Zimbabwe, yeah, yeah. Uh, Botswana, Botswana, yeah, 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 yeah. come to South Africa. Yeah. And there is, right. to the extent that there is xenophobic uh, instances where mm. mobs have gone out and looking for uh, foreign nationals. So, yeah, yeah. So it is in Nigeria, uh, where I served, uh, there used to be a lot of Ghanaians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at a time when there was unemployment. Uh, and Nigerians wouldn't get a job because they were uh, you know, sitting tight uh, and demanding a kind of salary. Uh, the Ghanaians would agree to work for half the salary. No, but actually, Especially. for our own security purposes, we need to have this information. You know, We need to use our IT skills. And it's possible. You can look at the person at the border when he's entering. Or at the you know, land border, air border, any border. Yeah. Uh, just a word about the minorities. Um, you know, I travel the Sundarban area very well. And every household has a Bangladeshi Hindu bride on the Indian side. Because when they're 15 or 16, uh, they the family doesn't want to keep them on the Bangladeshi side because, again, it's a sheer law and order problem. Uh, Sheikh Hasina, in fact, I would say uh, in the last 10 years or more, has been able to put in Hindu superintendents in the police, many such at the local governance level, to oversee that. But, you know, there's a mafia goonism working everywhere. And that's become a problem. In the city, the minorities don't complain at all. Uh, there are no issues. And if you look at the government structure, there are some very visible, well-known Hindus there. But it's at the local borders that there has a huge issue as we speak. It's a, it's a law and order that they've not been able to address. So most of them feel safer sending the girl into you know, marriage or other you know issues there. But uh, On the illegal migration, I think the illegal migration right now, the numbers are much lower. It's a problem of yeah. the much lower, much lower. The handful maybe, but the problem is of what do we do with the population which is already existing? Unfortunately, there is very little we can do. Uh, you know, it's not only that. I mean, I've seen when I had a service help with my house, I knew where she was born because I know her mother. Uh, I wasn't able to get her Aadhaar card out for her without paying the extra. I refused to, and I was saying that at a conference on, in the Northeast, and I remember the police commissioner said, come to my office, I'll get it done. I said, no, I want it through the legal problem. But the problem is that these people who are spread all over from Punjab to Kanyakumari have used every means which is available to get them sense ID. So now what do we do with that? But now we have to address that there's some future we don't. Friendly country, we are not able to having a difficult conversation. I don't understand why. So, you know, there's a problem with it. Uh, in terms of what you're saying, what's a very uh, important issue here, because Bangladesh has requested uh, everyone, the, the, the developed countries, to push it to 2026, just to give them that little extra leeway. Now, uh, not only are there, we have 18 billion plus of which 16 billion, I think yesterday our High Commissioner was in Bangladesh I was telling us, is from India. Large chunk of that is the raw material towards the ready-made garment industry. Also, a lot of our own ready-made garment industry is actually outsourced there. So both ways we are going to be hit badly. The ready-made garment industry is also run like sweatshops. They're running into problems, issues. But once and while US and Europe, the way I see it, will certainly kind of, you know, slowly step it up. It won't be an overnight change. This has to affect us largely. So there's a lot of conversation about how they need to diversify their basket uh, in terms of technological advancement. The pharmacy sector is very strong, uh, which they need to work on. But again, uh, I always believe Bangladesh has become Bangladesh. The miracle story is because of Bangladeshis and their own entrepreneur skills. So they will find a way to you know, come in and find another niche market, but very correctly so, ready-made government is going to get a hit. In all of this, at the VIF, we had, uh, I had initiated a project on developing a value chain, where we know Sri Lanka, India, uh, Bangladesh together can beat the world on ready-made government. Uh, so we had brought in Nepal also, and we are saying that why don't we start our own monopoly? For instance, linen is best in uh, 
Sri Lanka. Let's give the entire linen where it goes to I mean, Marks and Spencer, any other country from there. Hosiery is our strength. So why are we not able to, unfortunately, VIF and like rest of the organization in India, our support in terms of funds was so little that Dr. Gupta for a while said, Sri Radha, this can't, I mean, we need it, we done that. I mean, there's a report which is available also on their website. We'd worked on that, anticipating this problem. But we need to consolidate now because all of us are going to be badly hit here in this thing. But unfortunately, uh, but Bangladesh, again, as I said, I'm, I have a lot of faith on the entrepreneurs there. Uh, they will find a way out. I mean, however way it is. One is a bit of the bottoms-up approach. I sincerely believe, and again, at Free IF, I've tried to do that very strongly, is get the youth involved. Uh, so schools, not only in urban, but across. So in fact, hopefully, as soon as the Indian election is over, we'll be able to kick in that thing. Where they need to, and I come, I mean, you know, this alumni network is something, I don't always believe that the US, I'm part of the alumni network. I haven't seen US ask me for anything in the last 20 years. Uh, but for every program where they think that I fit in, they put me. So she and I were part of a NATO program where nobody else had gone, but just a handful of us because alumni decided we were fitting. So, so I'm saying the alumni network actually keeps us. I mean, all of I'm screaming horse about anti-US all the time, but that doesn't stop them from outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, we have lost that. But right now I'm saying it's again, you know, it's a work in progress. Right now, my whole agenda in the Bangladesh is that's the youth. They are the ones who's going to take the relationship forward. We've got our history, geography, everything. The youth are a different generation. We won't get that pulse as yet. That's something that I, we need to work on more strongly. Thank you. On the issue of uh, Sarvaj mentioning about the CA and the NRC, I think uh, Indian government discussed a lot about the NRC and CAA. The problem with CA, which Bangladesh government had, because we announced uh, that the Hindu minority, the persecuted uh, minorities in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And remember this, your friend was in government, Sena. So when you have a cut of up 2014, BNP started saying that, see, you are the greatest friend of India. See what India is doing to you. So probably what we could have done, since probably our objective is to but Pakistan, we could have said persecuted minorities in the neighborhood or Hindu minorities in the neighborhood, especially in Pakistan. Leave out Bangladesh, don't their name because Hasina was in power. So you can't have a cut off period during her period when you project her is best uh, for the minorities. Many of the time, what happens to the minorities is also those people who are opposed to Hasina, they always feel that, you know, if they attack the minorities, it will delegitimize Hasina's government in front of Indian eyes. So that also part of the attack is also like that. And part, as, as ma'am said, uh, you know, the West Property Act, which was earlier the Enemy Property Act. The indoctrination by Wahhabis uh, is really a problem. Like, for example, when I went to Chittagong, that Hatajari Madrasa of, uh, you know, Havasat Islami, in, I was a little surprised to see a very Arabic kind of clothes, which I don't see in Dhaka. Dhaka is much more uh, East Asia kind of, uh, you know, Islam. You have pink, purple, uh, many other colors, or maximum people will cover their head. But uh, in Chittagong, I saw people almost, you, you will feel that probably the person can't see that kind of thing. So I was a little surprised by that. But also at the same time, when one looks at this creeping Wahhabism, uh, there is also the Bengali culture. Like, for example, the Pohila Paisa celebration, which is done in a very large manner, uh, the Saraswati Puja in Dhaka University, which is, I think, is a very Eastern thing. Uh, in all the educational institutions, you will have Saraswati Puja. Uh, yeah, yeah, it has gone down, but it's still there. What I'm saying is that there are people, like, you know, their fate is very much linked to the minorities. For example, the secularist. Without minorities, you know, speaking of secularism doesn't make any sense. They know that they will survive if the minorities survive in, in that sense, because they speak about pluralism, they speak about culture, uh, this. And second thing, which we probably do not take into account, if you, whenever I compare it with Pakistan, you do not have the Sharia courts in Bangladesh. Uh, it is still People's Republic of Bangladesh, not Islamic. It's a, a rising sun uh, in the in flag. And also at the same time, Ahmadiyya still remain Muslims in spite of all the impacts. So while there is creeping, uh, 
you know, Islamism in terms of the visible Islamism in terms of dress up and all like uh, 20, uh, 2004 when I was there, I see one in 10 people who will wear, you know, whatever you can identify. Now probably 10, you'll find two who, you know, were like us, but everybody wears burqa. But then again, when I go back to my home state in Qatar, I see so many people wearing burqa. They're always there because I studied there. I never saw them. So whether we should treat Bangladesh's increasing Islamism just as a case, uh, you know, only one case, or whether we should look at the global phenomena, this assertion of identity and showing that we are, uh, you know, Muslims. Because uh, I only, uh, you know, recently when I went to, you know, Qatar, I was a little surprised. I never saw, you know, they studied with us, but they were like us. So you could never make out who is Muslim, who is a Hindu or who is, uh, who is what. On uh, illegal immigration, I completely agree that probably what ma'am is saying is very, very practical. Probably we'll need to start uh, doing that. And I also agree that, as you said, you know, the youth are very, very significant. Engage them. Uh, they may not agree with you, but uh, the moment they don't agree with you, we should not have to isolate them, you know, engage them. But that probably will be the way out. Um, I think you wanted to... Aap batayin, kuch bol rahe the? Yeah, yeah, bol We have a GPS, a parametric coaches, a intelligence agency, a freebie, intelligence agency. Or Maras Mahamari Sunka, Kartijari, Hindu, Ruki, Bartijari, Kamsakamuni Hindu, Yamlano, Apomari, Mr. Takisa Kansal, his Abundantism. Joe Mavi Paksam, oh, I give you a money to someone manager. They can omnet the sun with the Sadi Wapis image. After you remember the Tatar, Wongi, Amri, DMO, SSP, who came part via. Zimbabwean की झुग्गी जॉब में पड़ी हुई है कोई कार्रवाई नहीं मुद्दे हैं बस वोट लो और चलो पर ये उनको आप वापस क्यों नहीं भेजे आप किसान को तो पकड़ के ले जा रहे हो कि आपने पत्ती जलाई आपका एनडीटी का फैसला है लेकिन उस पे ना सैटेलाइट चल रहा है ना जीपीएस चल रहा है ना उनमें पीएसएफ चल रहा है ना इंटेलिजेंस एजेंसी चल रही है और एनआरसी सीसीए सोशल में लगे भाई आप प्रजातंत्र अगर आप बदल दिए एक ठीक है नहीं आप सही कह रहे yeah. yeah, ठीक है चीजें इतनी आसान नहीं होती हैं देखिए मैं सुनिए सुनिए अब आप आपने के आपने आपने अपनी बात कर दी ना कैसे चलिए आप ये देखिए रोहिंग्यास जो जिनकी जिक्र कर रहे हैं आप उनको पकड़ के 
बांग्लादेश या म्यांमार में छोड़ना आसान नहीं है क्यों तो नहीं आसान है क्योंकि तो कोई भी कंट्री उनको अपने देशवासी मानने के लिए तैयार नहीं है उस देश में छोड़ेंगे आप प्लीज मैं आपसे नहीं 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 प्लीज इसमें बहस नहीं करें मैं ये ये डिस्कशन फोरम एक नहीं नहीं आप मैं आपकी नहीं कर विचार आपका सुन लिया ठीक है विचार आपने बता दिया ना ठीक है उसमें रखे वहां पे और जो हमारे कितनी भी राष्ट्रवादी सरकार हो और कितनी भी कड़ सरकार हो सबकी कानून में काम करना पड़ता है और लिमिटेशन है इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन में चाइना का जो मुद्दा उठाया गया खैर इस इस हमारी संगोष्ठी के दायरे में नहीं है लेकिन बहुत कॉम्प्लिकेटेड इशू है इतना आसान नहीं है कि हम चाइना को हरा देंगे ये आ, हमको मजबूत रहना है और अपने दिलो दिमाग से मानसिकता को निकाल देना है कि हम चाइना से हार जाएंगे लेकिन शायद वक्त ऐसा भी नहीं आया कि हम चाइना को हरा देंगे तो चाइना के जो एक्टिविटीज हो रही हैं उनके लिए हमको ध्यान देना है वी हैव टू बी माइंडफुल एंड वी हैव टू बी विजिलेंट बट ओवर ऑब्सेसिवनेस जस्ट हेल्प अस दैट इज द पॉइंट दैट आई वाज ट्राइंग टू मेक बट एनीवे हम लोगों का बहुत अच्छा डिस्कशन रहा और आप सब लोगों को उस चीज की बधाई देना चाहता हूँ खासकर हमारे जो प्रेजेंटर्स हैं आई विल रिक्वेस्ट नाउ धर्म प्रकाश uh who is the research assistant in our um, organization antarrashtriya sahyog parishad and has played a key role in putting together this uh, event to please formally propose a vote of thanks for our uh, visitors thank you sir uh, i think with the great honor i feel that i stand for this day represented by on behalf of antarrashtriya sahyog parishad Contesting us with your steady importance and invaluable contribution to this event. First and foremost, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to the distinguished dignitaries who have enlightened us with their insightful presentation. Ambassador Vinod Sikri, Vice Chairman, Chairperson of South Asian Foundation, Dr. Sri Radha Datta, Professor at Indian Global International Office, Hobi. Jindal Global University and uh, Professor Priti Patnaik, a uh, senior uh, research uh, research fellow, a Nobel Prize winner of Defense Study, and a and a Vice New Delhi. Your profound thoughts and experience have enriched our understanding and inspired us to seek for greater cooperation and understanding of inter-Bangladesh relations. I am also deeply grateful to Dr. Markandeer Rai sir. Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee (ARP) for warm welcome remarks, setting the tone of the gathering with wisdom and encouragement. Special appreciation is also extended to Mr. Chacha for his enlightening concluding remarks, which have provided provide us with valuable insights and perspective to ponder upon. I must also extend my special thanks to Sir Dalai Lama Sir, Professor Gopal Rao Sir. Uh, our professor, Amit Professor, Anil Sir, uh, for guiding and for uh, guiding in this event. Furthermore, I wish to express my gratitude to all the members of ARP for participating and participating online. With the dedication and commitment have made this workshop a uh, resounding success. In closing, I extend my deepest uh, regards and thanks to all who have contributed to this. Thank you, Dr. Ah, uh, now, now I invite you all for hiking. Thank you. 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 Thank you.